You're listening to The Dollop on the All Things Comedy Network. We are a American history podcast. Each week, I, man with hair, man with eyes, God. man with one foot, <laughs> what? Dave Anthony oh reads a story God. from American history to his, friend. to his friend, Gareth Reynolds, who has no idea what the topic is going to be about. It's about feet. That's the ruse. It is about foots. Okay. And called it, quote, his jam pad. Jam pad? I'm the fucking hippo guy. Dave, okay. My name's Gary. <laughs> My name's Gary. <laughs> Wait, is it for fun? And this is not going to become the Tiggly Podcast. Okay. This is like anarchy. On a five-part coefficient. <laughs> My room is Now hit him with the puppy. <laughs> you both present sick arguments. <laughs> no sleep till hippo. No sleep till hippo. That action part. Hi, Gary. No. Nicely done, my friend. No. No. <laughs> Rhoda. Rhoda in the court. Gareth. Yeah, Dave. Um, announcement. Oh, yeah? We. You got another foot. You. I did. I just got a foot. Congrats. Um, and during the music sting break mm-hmm. thing. Sure. Intro music. Sure. Well done. Um, well labeled. We have a date, new date to announce. Oh, we do for a tour, our touring. Okay, this one's going to take us far away. Oh dear, Los Angeles, California. Oh no, that's where all those liberal assholes live. That's right. It's on fire because they deserve it. Yeah. Um, how dare you create dare a fire? You, you create a fire. And I fired the fire. Now you want money for the fire? I just fired the fire. The fire's been fired. It's funny. Uh, the only time I've ever seen Trump quickly apologize is when firemen tell him to fuck off. Yeah. Um, you fired man. Uh, <laughs> so Los Angeles uh, on the nineteenth of January, tickets will go on on sale through the Patreon uh, for Patreon subscribers on uh, Tuesday, and then on uh, Friday for the general public. And all the money is going to you getting that third foot. All uh, goes to the third. It'd be foot. nice to see you try <sighs> it out. <laughs> yes. Uh, you guys, there are still tickets available for our Boston, our second Boston show, the late show on uh, this Friday, um, or wait, Saturday, uh, Saturday uh, on the seventeenth, the Wilbur. at the Wilbur. Uh, we also uh, are going to be at the Royal Oak in Michigan uh, on the thirtieth. Uh, we'll be in Chicago on December first. That might be sold out. It's very, very close. Uh, and then in December. On the 13th, we'll be in Dallas. On the 14th, we'll be in Austin. On the 15th, we'll be in Houston. Yeah, Dallas. Oh, we're also Phoenix on January 18th. Uh, Tuesday, November 13th, I'll be at the Sycamore Tavern doing a show called The Dojo at 8. I'll also be there uh, Thursday, the 15th uh, at 10 p.m. with uh, my boy Sam Tripoli. Uh, Then uh, November 29th, I'll be at Club Giribaldi in uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin doing a show there. Doors at 7 p.m. I've got links to that at uh, GarethReynolds.com, all that stuff. Uh, December 7th and 8th, I'll be at Flappers at 10 p.m. And then December 27th, 28th, 29th, maybe 30th, I'll be at the American Comedy Company in San Diego, California. I'm sorry about that. It's okay, Dave. Um, anything else you want to tell people? Anything going on in your life that you want to discuss? You know, Jose's got a big climbing post, mm-hmm. and he loves it, and he's That's up there great. most of the time, That's and uh, he fights me. And my brother mm-hmm. came over last night and said, whoa, he put on weight. And uh, I said, you know, that's not uh, the sort of stuff uh, we like to hear here at Garecore. Because, uh, well, again, you... we have standing desks. So, uh, you know, we're, we're burning calories. Um, he's prairie dogging up he's his He's not desk. prairie dogging at yeah, all. Yeah, he is. He prairie he's... dogs a lot. He's well, a 30% prairie dog. If by prairie dog, you mean laying down in a hole. Hey, you asked me what was new, pal. I did. We're talking about the situation with your cat. It's not a it's, situation. Uh, it's an obesity situation. It is not an obesity situation. No. No. He's wasting away. When people come in and, and are startled by the size, the roundness, the thickness of your animal, that's a problem. My brother is a weight embellisher. Have Always con- has been. Have you considered not feeding him ham and lasagna? Hey, listen, you're, you're talking about moving away from the Garfield diet? That's you better right. go F yourself, pal. <laughs> he knows what he's doing. August 29th, 1963. Bow, now, now, now. Year of our Lord uh-huh. Jesus Christ. In the black room with black curtains. I'm going to sort of Forrest Gump the scene for the audience. Sure. In the stage. John Sidney McCain the third. 
Oh, sweet bastard. Was born on a military base in the Panama Canal Zone. He was born on a military base. Yeah. So he was, this was his destiny. Oh, fuck yeah. He was the middle of three kids. Uh, John's family had I'm a been... little worried about this already. You should be. Yeah, because I... You enjoy the man. I, I Yeah, I like the man. Okay, yeah. well, good luck with that. Oh, boy. John's family had been in the military since forever. His ancestors served in every U.S. war from the Revolution to World War II. Wow. His grandfather's uncle created the modern military draft... His grandfather, an admiral, commanded all naval war power during World War II. Okay. So, of course, his father was in the military. Sure. John admired his father, but they weren't close. Uh, Jack was an alcoholic, although John was convinced his father never told a lie. Okay. Yeah, most alcoholics stick to the truth script That's right. for the most part. It's a classic alcoholic I was thing. cheating on you, okay? <laughs> I'm sorry, Becky. <laughs> I got to shoot straight. <laughs> Uh, John's mom came from a millionaire wildcatting oil family. Wildcatting? Yeah, we did a, we did an episode about wildcats. So Texas. oh, wildcatting, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Jack also made admiral. I'm doing heavy catting. Yeah. Uh, okay, so McCain you know, is. I, I don't know how to respond to that one. Oh, nobody does. <laughs> <laughs> so his dad makes admiral. So. They're the first father son admiral team to be. Uh, oh admiral yeah, team. yeah, that's right. As a kid, John had a bit of an anger issue okay. uh, starting very young. When he was two, he would become so angry he would hold his breath until he passed out. Oh, well, that's just that's just kids being kids, Dave. That's normal. Yeah, that's yeah. what you do. Very, so yeah. mad you try to... You go against human instincts. It's important to... This is land drowning is what this that's is. That's right. Yeah. His parents would then dunk him in ice water. So his parents would waterboard him to get him breathing again? <laughs> yeah, they were... they. They thought the best way... We to, also invented waterboarding. Well, if your kid's angry, the best way to deal it with it is to treat him like a terrorist or a spy. No, absolutely. The first thing you do is put the kid on ice. Yeah. Put him in the champagne bucket. Um, at 12, his family settled in Arlington, Virginia. Okay. Which, for people who don't know, is right outside Liberal. of D.C. Right. Uh, Jack was the Navy's liaison officer to Congress. They entertained political and military figures. They, so his, oh, okay, his job okay. is to wine and die in Congress for the Navy, okay, right? Okay, right. Uh, being a Navy kid, John went to a lot of schools. At each school, he'd fight the first kid who provoked him. Did he think it was jail? Yes. He's like, what you do in school? You find the biggest kid and you beat the snot out of him. You got to be the craziest guy in school. Yeah. That's how school works. Hey, wait, we haven't sworn yet. We oh, could make this a no swearing app. Because okay. that's these teachers when we were on tour I were don't know saying, if this is the one they want, but Okay, maybe. well, then yeah. fuck that. Let's keep going. Uh... So, um, so right. So, quote, to impress upon my classmates that I was not a person to suffer slights lightly. Wow. So he really was taking the prison mentality yes. and just finding the guy and just beating him up. A hundred percent. Okay. He, he literally walked into every school and was like, I'm the not fuck with you guy. Yeah. yeah. And, then, and then held his breath. They were like, oh, and, just and, beat oh, up the kid. He's passing out. <laughs> Put him in ice. Uh, oh, thank God, sweet ice. Get oh, ice. sweet ice. Oh, the hill. Warming embrace of ice my father would never give I me. I love you, Dad. Uh, he got the nickname McNasty. Whoa. See, so far, I'm loving everything I'm hearing. <laughs> McNasty. <laughs> he went to elite all-boys uh, schools, all-white prep schools. He was often disciplined for fighting. Well, hey, listen, you're in the realm of McNasty. Yeah, yeah. Deal with it. After high school, John went to the U.S. Naval Academy. His first trip at sea was to Rio. Okay. Uh, the captain had been a student of his father. Okay. So, so while his classmates just... studied, uh, John uh, piloted the ship back and forth. Oh, Rio. wow. How old? He's 18? Uh, he's in the Naval Academy, so I think he's he's out of high school. Wow, okay. Um, in Rio, he hung out with admirals and the president of Brazil. Sure. Like any, like any young, sure. young yeah. academy no, member. Oh, yeah. Uh, at the academy, John and his friends would drink. They'd sneak off grounds and get into fights. He was nearly kicked out of the academy uh, for his behavior, but his mother intervened and he was allowed to stay. He just beat up the superintendent of the Navy. <laughs> uh, John did not like people saying that he got special treatment. Oh, well, yeah. McNasty's going to have to beat people, beat people away from people. that. Yeah. <laughs> After his mom saved, uh, saved him from getting kicked out of school, 
The commandant told them he was, quote, spoiled, which John greatly resented. Okay. For years, he heard his family helped his career, and he never got over it. Quote, I grew red-faced and angry every time some know-it-all told me how easy a life my father had made for me. Okay. <laughs> Chip it away. Phil Butler, who lived across the hall from him, said, quote, May I get you anything, Master McNasty? <laughs> no, same. Master McNasty, anything from the poop deck? It's just, just his last name. He's yes. Not. Uh, I'm if from the Butler family. If your name is, last name is Butler, it doesn't mean you're uh, Shall I measure you for uh, pants? Okay. I'm Rick Taylor. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, I'm Butler. I'll get you whatever you need. More ice for your bath? McNasty? Yeah. <laughs> Quote, he was a huge screw-off. He was always on probation. The only reason he graduated was because of his father and his grandfather. Man, he would not like to hear that quote. <laughs> He's like, What? <laughs> John proved his doubters wrong when he graduated. 894 out of 899 cadets. Hey, that's awesome. Those five worst people. That's right. Yeah, or four, I guess. Yeah, I'm you're... probably, usually in that situation, a couple of them got into like a car or train They're accident. not at graduation. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Jonathan went, McNasty. He went, he went to flight school in Pensacola, Florida. Okay. There, he crashed into Cor Cor Corpus Christi Bay on a flight. He was rescued. The plane sank. A Navy report concluded John failed to, quote, maintain an airspeed above the stall speed. What? So he's just... He flew a plane so slow that it stalled and crashed. So he was driving like a senior citizen in the air? Yeah. Just like, on like 20? Yeah. Oh, boy. But he graduated. His signal's on. What is he doing up what there? What is going on with this Jesus guy? Jesus Christ. When is, is he turning or not? He graduated in 1960. Soon he was on a training mission in southern Spain where he flew too low. Okay. He hit electrical wires and That's caused real a low. massive blackout in Spain. Oh, jeez. That's not great. LA Times quote, he brought his crippled Sky Raider back to the intrepid dragging 10 feet of wire. He brought the plane back? Yeah, well, it, he just, like, screwed up a wing and just dragged damaged the wing it, back. but he flew the plane back, and it's covered oh, he in flew it back. electric wire. Okay, so he's... Sure. <laughs> like a cartoon character. Sure, yep, very much like uh, when a billionaire decides to fly a hot air balloon around the world. <laughs> he severed an oil line, and he and the plane were completely covered in oil. He was lucky to survive. Okay. In 1964, John began dating Carol Shep. Okay. Ex-model. On weekends, he'd fly a Navy plane to Philly to see Carol. Okay. He's like flying into her house. Yeah. One trip while he was flying back, he crashed. So, huh? at this point, I guess I would be gathering that he has a propensity for crashing. Well, he's not great at the flying of a plane. He thing. seems to be able to get it up there yeah, pretty Yeah, yeah, well. he can get it up. But then... Uh, Staying up's harder. Yeah. Is this a Viagra ad? Uh, yep. John said, there was an ex John said there was an explosion in the engine, and he lost power, and he had to bail when the engine wouldn't restart. Okay. Seven weeks later, the Naval Aviation Safety Center said it could not corroborate his account. They found, quote, no discrepancies which would have caused or contributed to engine failure or malfunction. The report concluded John had made several errors and was lucky to be alive. Okay. But two weeks after issuing the report, the safety center revised all of its findings. Uh, the accident is that was now. The admiral passed? That's weird that that would happen. <laughs> that is weird that that would happen. Sure. Uh, on second thought, it did explode. Sorry no, about that. No, he's right. Uh, the accident was now due to a failure of a, quote, undetermined component in the engine. Sure. Like a comb or something. Or a ghost. Or yeah. An engine ghost. Right. Okay. Uh, any of his uh, three crashes would have ended almost all Navy pilots' careers. Nine times out of ten, you lose your wings for crashing one plane, let alone three. Three. Right. The Spain situation. He also took the power out of Spain. Well, that which led to an international incident. Okay. Uh, would have, quote, found themselves as the deck officer on a destroyer someplace in a hurry. But John had family pull. So that's like the equivalent of when a cop gets desk duty. Yeah, he should have been. He, in, anybody crashing three planes is not a Navy pilot. They anymore. frown upon that in the Navy. Yeah, yeah, it's not great to crash. 
Like if your job is to fly a fly plane, it and land it, but you don't do that, that's you're a, not good at the job. Right. Okay. Yeah. So for those of us listening, mm -hmm. uh, the crashing of the plane, I yes. think what David is saying is uh, is not what the Navy is after. Yeah, they're not looking for crashing of planes. Right. Okay. Great. John now wanted to go to Vietnam to boost his profile as a pilot. Okay. But they weren't sending him. They because, don't have power lines. Well, they weren't sending him because he had crashed three planes. Right. And again, just if, for people who are just right. turning in, the Navy, yeah. not into that. Not, not that into Right. It. So like most pilots, John had a game of tennis with the undersecretary of the Navy. Sure. And there he talked him into sending him to Vietnam, despite his terrible flight record. It's a hard sport to charm someone playing. It is. It's, there's quite a distance. It really is. You've got, you've got to get up there for volleys at the yeah, same time. A lot of volleys. Volley back and forth. You know, I'm thinking I could really help in Vietnam. Yeah. I think I got all the crashes out of my system. In 1966, he was sent to the USS Forstall in the South China Sea. By January 1967, John McCain was a lieutenant commander. Now, hmm? go ahead. Is is it weird that he's being promoted because of the well, track record? I believe that you're you're. I mean, I think a, as a pilot, as you move on as a pilot, you get automatically promoted. Like pilots have a higher status. Okay. And then and then I assume when you go to war, you get kicked up a little bit more. Sure. Like he was going on bombing runs. He was doing things. Okay. So. Okay. Uh, in July 1967, he was in the cockpit preparing to take off from the Forestall for a bombing run. No one knows exactly what happened, but a missile from a nearby plane hit the plane next to John. A missile, okay. From the from the forest hall. Okay, so it was a they. It was from from the ship they were on. They blew up one of their own planes. So some people some people say that uh, it was uh, an accident that it, it just went off. Well, I'm thing. hoping some, that's... some people blame John McCain. Uh, there's what a lot he of, fired a missile yeah, from the ship at himself? His own plane. He just accidentally hit the button. But so there's a lot of different uh, ideas. There's no, there's no, there's nothing that can verify that John McCain did that. But it's one of those rumors that's always been out there. Okay. Oh, um, but th the belief is is that it was an electronic malfunction from another plane that blew up the plane next to his. Okay. Explosions, right? Mayhem. Everything's sure. fucking now going crazy. Sure. Uh, he jumped out of his plane. He rolls through the flames and just starts running amid explosions. Shrapnel went into his chest and his legs, but he's not seriously injured. Others gave their lives to save the ship. They pushed jets into the sea to keep from bombs on the jets from going off. Right. So, so the, this, the whole fucking thing's on fire. Wow. OK. You need to get the planes that have bombs on them off the ship or they're going to blow up. Right. And that's so all bad. these guys are pushing the planes off the ship. Jeez. Lieutenant Commander uh, Herb Hope was, quote, Cornered by flames at the stern of the carrier, Hope hurled himself off the flight deck into a safety net and clambered into the hangar deck below where the fire was spreading. Hope then took command of a firefighting team that would ultimately save the ship. Now, that guy was three planes away from John. John, on the other hand, found safety in the reading room and watched on closed circuit television as his fellow soldiers saved the Forester. He watched on... The TV on the on the ship. Yeah, he went into the ready room and watched um, everybody else work to save the ship. Was as, he, I mean, as, he might have thought he as, was watching a movie or something. As he heroes didn't know. will do. He might could have very easily thought that he was watching a war film. And True. Like, Boy, this is a good one. The accident killed 134 men. Oh shit! In October 1967, during a bombing run on a, a, a Hanoi power plant, John was hit by a surface-to-air missile. He ejected. As he flew out, he broke his right knee. His arm snapped from the force of the wind, and he was knocked unconscious. Jesus. His chute opened. He landed in a lake in the middle of Hanoi. He was pulled out by North Vietnamese and attacked. His shoulder was broken. He was bayoneted, kicked, and beaten. He was interrogated for four days. He might have been killed, but the North Vietnamese learned that his dad was an admiral. Okay. And then they found this out because John told them. So he name-dropped. <laughs> By the way, that would come out real early if I, that was I, me. I, I, Four I days know. is quite a stretch. I know. I know. He's you're, you're, be four minutes before I'd be like, "Get me a phone. I'll call Daddy." You're not supposed to re reveal that kind of info, but I'm come on. I'm dropping that shit right, right off the bat. Away. <laughs> Here's a picture of him. Here's his number. But also, I'm not uh, I'm not flying a plane killing Vietnamese. Also, so uh, it's too different. Um, Rude. Yeah. Uh, 
So uh, John was interrogated and beaten. Um, he gave up the name of his ship, the number of the raids he had flown, his squadron number, and the target of his final raid. Okay. Or as Senator Fred Thompson said at the 2008 Republican National Convention, quote, when his captors wanted the names of other pilots in his squadron, John gave them, them the names of the offensive line of the Green Bay Packers. That year in Philly, John said he had given up the names of the Minnesota Vikings offensive line. How many offensive linemen have to die for this fib? In truth, he gave up the name of his ship, the number of raids he had flown, his squadron number, and the final target of his raid. But why not switch that up? Jesus. I'm a little distracted because I heard the Packers. After six weeks, John had lost 50 pounds. He had dysentery. His hair had gone white, and he was in a chest cast. They those tried to. Yeah, those aren't abnormal. great. I mean, those are just bad. It's just a bad look, yeah. let alone everything else. Ow! Yeah. Okay. Uh, they tried to get him to sign and tape record a confession for his war crimes. He refused and was tortured for four days until he finally did. They put him in solitary and tried to get him to sign another confession. He wouldn't. He was tortured or put in solitary confinement confinement for 15 months. Holy shit. Yeah. Uh, so those guys were all really fucking horribly treated at the, what was known as the Hanoi Hilton. Yeah. Um, in September 1969, Ho Chi Minh died. The Vietnamese treated the prisoners better after. They were allowed to spend the day in a communal space. John and his fellow POWs uh, would reenact entire movies. So he's living like the one I was watching when the ship was going down or like there's going to be one in the future. It's called Splash. Right. <laughs> I'm a mermaid. Look at New York, my love. Can you believe the big city? <laughs> oh, my God. I just walked into the bathroom and she's in the tub with a fish tail. Could you like could you reenact a movie? Oh, yeah. You could. Yeah. What do you want to say? I'll do it right now. What do you want to say? Name Dear Hunter. Boy, that's a tough one. Uh, <laughs> right, here we go. I haven't seen it, by the way. Uh, all right. So, uh, uh, hey, hey, what are we? Okay. <laughs> that was good. Hey, what are we? Hey, what are we credits? You know where uh, Jimmy Credits. A lot of uh, deer out here today. Mm, that's right. Credits. That's good. Yeah. Have you really never seen deer? No, I've seen deer. Okay. Not for eight. Um, so in the States, while this is going on, John's wife crashed her car into a telephone pole. What, did she take down the city's power? I think she was like, I love you. I know you're going through a hard time. I'm Honey, we have so much in common. <laughs> I just took down uh, Michigan's power. <laughs> uh, she had two smashed legs, a broken pelvis, a broken arm, and a ruptured spleen. She spent I like those moments where I hit a joke nicely, and then the next line is like, she was uh, dying. <laughs> <laughs> she spent six months in, months in the hospital and had 23 operations over the next two years. Holy shit. But I feel like that just means they weren't getting the operations right. Potentially, but I mean, <laughs> God, oh, my 23 operations. Yeah, that's a lot. Yeah. That's uh, three. Like you're getting a couple of those for free. You're having so many. Um, I hope so. You get a hospital punch card. Uh, yeah, they don't do that. Um, so in 1970, oh, by the way, uh, Ross Pro, champion of POWs, paid for her medical care. I want to give her all her money to pay for her bills, okay? I'm paying for 24 surgeries. I want her to have one extra. She doesn't need any more surgeries? We're going to give her one more. She doesn't need any more. We're, we're going to give her an extra finger. For what? Huh? We're going to change her eye color. No, none of that is. The American people have spoken, okay? And I'm going to do what they've always wanted. We're going to have a dog attached to her back. No, sir. That's 24 surgery. That's on Ross Perot. I support POW more than anybody. Okay? Yeah, but that's, I feel like that's not support. We're going to put a live dog on her back, and they're going to become a human-animal hybrid. All right? And the dog can vote. Okay? No. Well, look, I'm paying for one more. No, we, we're not doing one more. I'm going to have myself attached to her. No. Yes, I am. Yeah, the dog was a jumping off point. That's awful. Now I'm attaching myself to her. That, and we're not going to do that. She'll do all the walking. And if she gets tired, she'll bend down a little. Then I'll do some of the walking. We're not doing any of this. All right. Well, can I just get a Dr. Pepper then? Yep. All right. Uh, I'm a doctor. I disagree. Goodbye. It goes 19... out the window. <laughs> Mr. Perot. In 1973, John was released after five and a half years as a POW. Carol was now different. Because of all the surgeries, she was now 5'4". Wow. She had been 5'8 before. Wow. Jesus. Yeah. So she got really So that's a lot of removal and posture. Yeah, there's a lot of leg parts coming off. Oh, my God. Uh, She'd also put on a lot of weight. 
POWs were welcomed home as heroes, unlike a lot of other soldiers, right? Right. right. John wrote a 13-page story for the U.S. News and World Report. The New York Times put a photo of him arriving home on his front page. At the White House, he got a photo shaking Nixon's hand. He took part in parades, made appearances, and got fan mail. Ross Perot introduced him to California Governor Ronald Reagan. You're going to like this guy. Who invited John to be the keynote speaker at his annual prayer breakfast. Oh, the prayer breakfast. John's broken bones had not healed correctly. Uh, he had three operations and grueling physical therapy. He wanted to go. But his wife was like, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, you had 20 surgeries. 23. 24 once I'm fully attached. John wanted to go to the National War College, but one had to be a commander to do that, and he was only a lieutenant commander. The War College? Yeah, it's like it's the uh, like prestigious, most important, whatever. Okay. War. It's where you go if you want to kill people. Oh, great. For sure. the government. Sure. I'm in. Well, not like, like, do you have an application? Not like just randomly killing people on the streets, but like if you want to do it officially. Oh, right. Yeah. The heroic ones. Yeah, the one where you're not. Where you commit war crimes, but you, but you're not ever convicted. You, it's like free killing. I feel like you're adding some personal <laughs> attitude into this. Uh, he appealed all the way up to his dad's friend. The, yes, John. What do you need, McNasty? Secretary of the Navy, who somehow granted his request. Sure. So John was promoted to commander and went to the Na National War College in 1970. And that's usually how most people get promoted from lieutenant commander to commander is by asking a dad's friend. Oh, it is. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. After all his physical therapy, he passed the physical to get his flight status reinstated. Oh, Jesus. There are differing opinions on whether he earned it or was given special treatment. Wow. Why, I, why do you think people would think he was given special treatment? Well, uh, just because of McNasty's catchphrase, Daddy! <laughs> daddy, I want to fly again, Daddy. Uh, I, I'm very surprised by the... Uh, Nepotism factor. I've never heard about that. Oh, yeah, weird. You know, you didn't hear anything about John McCain. That's the interesting thing about John McCain. He was a senator, right? Mm. Oh, boy. He was assigned to the Hellraisers training squadron in Jacksonville, Florida. That's okay. Their nickname. That's their nickname, the Hellraisers. Uh, he was very in demand as a war hero and gave speeches all over the place. He wanted to run for office, but said there was too much competition okay. in the district. He was, he was also fucking tons of women, and adultery is a court martialable offense. Wow, so he's still married to Carol. Yeah, and he's banging everybody. Wow, okay. John was rumored to have been involved with a number of his subordinates. That's that's cool. okay to do. Super cool. Yeah. He was promoted in 1977 to captain and then to his father's old post as Navy liaison to Congress. Oh, wow, okay. Hmm. I wonder how that happened. I'd probably hard work and sweat. <laughs> He was basically the Navy's lobbyist. John was one of the most popular Navy liaisons in history. Now, he's clearly super likable. Yes. Senators and staffers hung out in his office and had drinks. The McCains entertained politicians in their home. But if an admiral's secretary called and asked John to hold for the admiral, John would slam the phone down. And when it rang again, he would yell into it, quote, I hung up. You can't presume that I'm as busy as you are. If you really want to talk to me, pick up the phone yourself and call me. Now, if that was sung, well, that's a lot less rude. It's weird. Ordinarily in the Navy, a captain wouldn't yell that at an admiral. Right. Ordinarily. Sure. Because of the uh, echelon of power. That's right. Right. In 1979, John met, John met Cindy Lou Hensley. Still, still married yeah, to yeah. Carol. Yeah, okay. still married. He met Cindy Lou Hensley in Hawaii. She was a special education teacher, former rodeo beauty queen, former USC cheerleader, and her dad owned one of the largest Anheuser-Busch beer distributors in the United States. Okay, so probably like grew up in a one-bedroom house. Yeah, yeah, right. super poor. Right. Uh, she said she was 24. Uh, oh, no, she, she was 24. He was 42. He told her he was 38, and she said she was 27. Oh, well, that's fun when you kind of lie to the middle together. That means you got a lot in common. <laughs> that's, that's amazing. Lying up about your age. Yeah, yeah okay. That is cute. Over the next year, John flew to Arizona and courted Cindy. And he's still married. Oh, you picked up on that. Yeah. Like any beautiful romance story, John uh -huh. proposed to Cindy while no. still living with no. his wife, what? Carol. I, th 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 what? I, that, I've never, we've had that a few times on the show. That move is so insane to me. Yeah, you're a psychopath. I mean, you really have to, like... For a year, while living with his wife, 
he flew to another state and courted and dated a woman while married to his wife. There was a woman who lived with him for a little while, and she said that there was no indication there was anything wrong between John oh, and Carol. Wow. Carol thought they had a wonderful relationship. Oh, my God. So she lost four inches from her overall height, and he went to Arizona every weekend to lose four inches in uh, Cindy. Who? Aaron, can you hit the Cindy? <laughs> Carol had absolutely no idea. Quote, I didn't know Did anything. And Cin Cid Cindy must have known about Carol. Yeah, right. she had to have. Carol had no idea. Quote, I didn't know anything about it. I was pretty much blindsided, and it broke my heart. In March... So he's just jack trippering from Arizona to wherever he lives with Carol. Yeah. Okay. In March 1980, six weeks after he divorced Carol, John and Cindy were married. He none, picked up the pieces fast. None of his children that he had with Carol attended the wedding for some reason. What do you think it was? I don't know. Seating? Yeah, or just so far away. Eloping. You know? They must yeah. have eloped. Yeah. After the wedding, John and Cindy found out about each other's real ages when a newspaper After? published it. Oh, God. Yeah, that's how they I'm a liar, <laughs> too. We're both fucking assholes. I am a liar. Oh I God. lied to you. So crazy. I, I also can't lied to that. you. You were married to someone? Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. weird. Yeah. <laughs> Anywho, oh, I love you. Love you. What a great. Want this, a Bud Light? This should really be like a, you want a, a Bud Light? story they tell in a movie. Want no, a Bud Light? I'm, I'm good with the Bud. You have to have one. Okay, now. I would like a Bud there Light. There you go. In the media, uh, this didn't look very great. Mm. Uh, so John got out in front of the story and he spun it and left out the details that he wanted secret. Okay. He admitted he had cheated, and he apologized. Okay. The press focused on what a humble, honest interview he gave. And what a great man he was to be so upfront about this mistake he had made. Man, that is, it's one of those weird standards we've always had yeah. where it's like some people will just get raked over the coals and then, you know, some people go on Jay Leno and just apologize. That's right. Yeah. They had four kids. Uh, one, Bridget, who was adopted from a Bangladesh orphanage. In 1891, his father died and John retired from the Navy after 23 years. He had been awarded the Silver Star, the Bronze Star, the Legion of Merit, a Purple Heart, and the Distinguished Flying Cross. Wow. John and Sidney moved it's to Arizona. It's weird that the Flying Cross is the only one I don't think I've heard of. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he didn't get the Crashing Cross, which he should have no. gotten three or four of. Sure. He actually crashed another plane. But sure. it, no, really? Yeah, he altogether was involved in about six uh, plane crashes. Oh, my God. John and Sidney moved to Arizona. Sidney's father gave John a job as VP of Public Relations for the Anheuser-Busch distributorship where you start starting at vp yeah you just walk in there and find the employee that's weakest and just beat the shit out that's of him right. and then you're vp that's how it works yeah uh a former executive at the company quote when you have the budweiser franchise you don't need pr okay so his role is vice president of pr yeah he's, his role is a uh, role uh, that's free been, money right yeah i want that job beer does not need advertising it no out, particularly no. budweiser <laughs> yeah no you don't need a PR guy for Budweiser. Uh, so when you're a distributor, especially. So so John's basically just waiting for political opportunity to open up. OK. At an event in Arizona, Charles Keating Jr., an Arizona developer and anti-porn crusader, introduced himself and they quickly became friends. How you doing? I hate porn. I hate porn, too. Yeah, I'm a really hate it. <laughs> I used to be a Navy pilot. Ah, I just really loathe pornography. <laughs> In January 1982, the congressman from the district next in the McCain's announced he was retiring. Okay. That very day, Cindy bought a house in his district. Okay. Which is super easy to do. I don't know if you've ever bought a house. No, it's easy to super do. Super easy to buy one immediately. Oh, that day. yeah. You just, yeah. I've, I've Amazoned a couple houses yeah. in my place <laughs> this week. Two months later, John announced his candidacy for Congress. Okay. John liked to say he campaigned six hours a day, six days a week, going through two pairs of shoe during the campaign. Shoes. He bragged, okay. He bragged how hard he walked and worked. Okay. He did not mention he spent 313000 far more than anyone else in the campaign. Okay. Half came from loans to himself, and another hundred k came from Charles Keating. Oh, okay. You promised to get rid of porno, right? Yes. You swear to God? Porno's bad. It's the worst thing ever. Mm. I like it. Busty bosoms. Mm, terrible. Sweaty sweet, genitals. Hot, wet stuff. Man on top of a lady. Oh, oh God. I planes. Pick, yeah, planes, planes, planes. 
Sydney and her dad also invested uh, 359000 in the shopping center Charles Keating was building. <laughs> okay. John went and served uh, two terms in the house, right? So he just fucking rolled through the house. Sure. Almost as soon as he hit D.C., the Washington Post in 1982 suggested he was not a Reagan man, but a pragmatic, non-ideological Republican. Okay. But John was a standard Reagan conservative, backing trickle-down economics, opposing equal rights. Busing, the use of federal funds for abortions, for poor women. He also voted against making making MLK uh, a holiday. Wait, he was pro? He was anti-abortion. Oh, very anti-abortion. Okay, right, okay. Uh, and against a, an MLK holiday. Sure. So he was a typical right-wing Reagan Republican. Sure. In 1986, John told a joke during a speech in D.C. Quote, I have a really bad feeling about this. Did you hear the one about the woman who was attacked on the street by a gorilla, beaten senseless, raped repeatedly, and left to die? When what, she... The, uh, what the... He's what? giving a speech at a private function. Still, the setup is he's horrifying. Tell, he's telling a joke. Not well. Did you hear the one about the woman who was attacked on the street by a gorilla, beaten senseless, raped repeatedly, and left to die? When she finally regains consciousness, she tries to speak. Her doctor leans over to hear her sigh contently and to feebly ask, where is that marvelous ape? Oh, my God. The Maverick. Wow. John McCain. Good Lord. I wonder, and how do you react to a joke like that? You're like, okay, is there a punchline? Well, why not tell that joke? Because he was now running for the Senate. <laughs> okay. John won the, the Senate seat. In 1987, federal auditors were looking at Charles Keating's Lincoln Savings and Loan. Keating called Arizona State Senator Dennis D. Consini, whom he had donated a lot of money to. Okay. He told D. Consini to put together a meeting with the five senators he had given a lot of money to, one of whom was John McCain. Uh, before I let you go, have you heard the one about the uh, rape ape? <laughs> oh, man. Sit down, pal, because you're going to laugh yourself off whatever you're yeah. next to. So John altogether, over his uh, political career, had gotten 112000 in contributions from Charles. Okay. As well as Charles holding you know, dinners for him, fundraising dinners right. and whatnot. And John had helped Charles co-sponsoring a resolution to delay regulations against savings and loans. It's, it's amazing how <laughs> it's <laughs> always been this way. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but at first, John did not want to go to this meeting that Charles wanted him to go to. Okay. Uh, Keating called John a wimp, and John heard about it. And next, Keating marched into John's office and handed John a list of demands that he was going to show federal, reg federal regulators. Oh, shit. John went to the meeting. Okay. It was with the chairman of the Federal Home Loan Bank Board. Deacon, gotcha. Deacon Cini and four senators. Now, that guy, the chairman, didn't know anything about the investigation that was happening, so he set up a meeting with regulators who did. Okay. And that meeting was with three... Higher up regulators at the Federal Home Loan Bank Board in San Francisco, including the director. Okay. The regulators realized right away when the five senators came in and a state senator that Keating, Charles Keating, was trying to show off his power. Oh, shit. One of the regulators, William Black, took notes. John said, quote, one of our jobs as elected officials is to help constituents in a proper fashion. ACC, so ACC is the company that controls the Lincoln Savings and Loan. Okay. Right? ACC is a big employer and important to the local economy. I don't want any special favors for them. I don't want any part of our conversation to be improper. Immediately, the regulators became nervous. Yeah. It was a very weird thing to say. Yeah. Black, quote, McCain was the weirdest. McCain was wringing his hands about what to do. Yeah, <laughs> stereotype, <laughs> greedy stereotype. <laughs> The regulators said this was a very unusual meeting to have. Black, Senate historians were unable to find any instance in U.S. history that was comparable in terms of five U.S. senators meeting with a regulator on behalf of one institution, and it has not happened since. And that's really saying something. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's bold. The meeting out went on for a while. John tried to act like he was just a senator making sure Lincoln Savings was, quote, fairly treated. 
Sure. Black said that was bullshit. Okay. Keating was a powerful political godfather in Arizona. Finally, the director said they were referring the case to the Department of Justice. Like, they were not supposed to tell him this, but they just got tired of the fucking bullshit. Okay. Of the movie. And she throws down, they're referring to the Department of Justice. There are tons of charges coming. Quote, I can't tell you strongly how serious this is. This is not a profitable institution. They were told not to tell the savings and loan and Keating anything. A month later, the regulators recommended Lincoln Savings be seized by the government. Okay, so this is going according to plan. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's when there was a shakeup at the regulator's office. Oh, my God. Black and the director were out. A new guy took over. John McCain. The investigation was moved to San Francisco, from San Francisco to Washington, D.C., and a brand new audit was ordered. Oh, boy. Black was furious. Quote, we were clearly shot in the back. But word got out to the parent company of Lincoln, ACC, and they celebrated. Quote, someone hurled a computer from the second floor, shattering a window. Keating struck a Superman pose and ripped open his shirt to display a hand-drawn skull and crossbones over the letters FHLBB, Federal Home Loan Bank Board. Jesus. So they are Wolf of Wall Street partying. <laughs> they are Led Zeppelining. Potted plants were knocked over. Beer and champagne were spilled Dude, all over desks. Dude, a guy threw a computer out the window. Get out of here with your potted plants. Keating yelled, get this champagne colder. <laughs> Put it in the McCain bath. <laughs> wow. But, get the champagne colder. Yeah. <sighs> but Keating's businesses were going down. There was soon an investigation into the five senators' misconduct. Okay. John then showed how he could play the press. He got out right in front of the story and got himself constantly on TV. Whereas the other guys hid from it. John was all over it, right? He goes on Nightline. He goes on This Week with David Brinkley. He's on everything. And he leaks information. He did a show at the Apollo. He did a show at the Apollo. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Got he, booed well, off. Yeah, the Sandman still, took yeah, him away. Sandman but, took yeah. him away. He didn't rub the log. Nope. Um, he also started leaking information about his fellow senators and De Consini to make himself seem not it's as bad. so, like, high school. Yeah. It's unbelievable. Wow. It's also kind of Trumpy, the, the way that you're like, I will tell the narrative. Oh, this seems Trumpy. Okay. Knock it off. Uh, but under oath, John said he had absolutely nothing to do with the leaks. Hmm. A congressional investigator, quote, McCain was one of the principal leakers. Okay, so... All right, so he perjured himself. That's, but yeah, that would be perjuring yourself. Beyond yeah. that. John underwent two months of daily televised hearings. He would alternate between tearful remorse and angry defiance at this political witch hunt. Okay. Two years after the meetings, during which time the SNL kept fucking people over, after the senators got the investigation moved and delayed, the government seized Lincoln Samings alone. Okay. So they, they got it. They it was going to be seized two years before. These mm -hmm. senators made that not happen, mm -hmm. and in that time, the savings and loan and other savings and loans continued to do b the business of fucking over investors. Mm -hmm. Twenty thousand investors had bought junk bonds, believing they were federally insured. <laughs> they were not. Their savings were wiped out. Taxpayers. This were is called Wells Fargoing. <laughs> Taxpayers were on the hook for $3.4 billion. Dollars. Oh, my God. Jesus. Uh, Black, William Black, quote, McCain saw the political pressure on the regulators. He could have saved these widows from losing their life savings, but he did absolutely nothing. I should also add that my grandparents lost a shitload of money because of what McCain did. Then it was revealed by the Arizona Republic paper that Cindy and her dad had invested 350000 in the shopping center. That's not going to be good. And that the McCains had made nine trips at Keating's expense. Oh, Jesus. Three to the Bahamas. <laughs> well, that you've got to win the, bah yeah, if you're gonna the go, Bahamian vote. Yeah, if you're going to go, you got a Bahamas. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if you're going to corrupt, corrupt yeah. in the Bahamas. Yeah, but they're a voting part of yeah, Arizona. Yep. John... Put the blame on Cindy 
because he said she was in charge of household finances. She lied to me about how old she was, goddammit. She's a liar. It was Carol. Awful Carol did this. The one that got shorter. The shorter one. I had a wife that was 5'8". I come back, she's 5'4". You tell me about that. I got one that's two years older than she's supposed to be and one that keeps shrinking. (laughs) When the Arizona Republic uh, called, the reporter asked John about it, and John called him a liar and said, quote, that's the spouse's involvement, you idiot. Do you understand English, don't you? Oh, Jesus. But then, pretty quickly, John read the wind and decided to become the best interviewee possible. So he went back to his old mode, right? Charm him. Get out in front of it and charm him. This was when the love affair between John and the media really blossomed. He's cheating on Cindy now? He held a 90-minute news conference and answered every single question. He said the shopping center deal was his his wife and father-in-law, and he had absolutely no idea about it. Of course, because when your wife buys into a shopping center, she doesn't mention that. it to her spouse. You don't talk about no, that. No, why would you talk stuff? about that sort of stuff? Why and would if you, you do ever... it's in passing. Yeah. You don't Oh, I did the dry cleaning, yeah. I went to the store, bought a shopping center, got my nails <laughs> done, got the tires rotated. I uh, came back, took a nap, Wait, cooked you for a little while. Yeah, tires oh, are That was kind of the yeah. highlight of the day, obviously. Yeah. 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 That's, that's it. Cool. What'd you crash today, hon? Uh, just four planes. All right. In November 1990, the Senate Ethics Committee came up with their punishments for the senators. We'd uh, like to see your wrists. John got a light scolding. Okay. For, quote, poor judgment for intervening with federal regulators. Okay. Yeah, that isn't poor judgment. Naughty, John. How dare you fuck humans out of their money? You get one spanking. Keating went to jail for 12 years, but it was overturned on a technicality. (laughs) John was the only senator who testified in a civil suit by shareholders, and the other senators refused. In the savings and loan scandal... The savings and loan scandal led to the failure of 747 savings and loans in the United States. The losses were 160.1 billion. Oh my god. 124.6 billion was paid by the government, which is which is also known as tax, the taxpayers. Right. So John, he did John crash McCain again. Got a scolding. Right. Only John and one other senator were reelected. The others retired. John called it, quote, the worst thing, the absolutely worst thing that ever happened to me. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Does that remind you of someone? Yes. Later, uh, he would call the Keating Five corruption scandal his, quote, asterisk. Oh, my God. Like you're Barry Bonds. <laughs> wow. That I mean, is people some... lost... Old people lost their savings. Do you know what that does? No, you don't. If you're raised in households yeah, that he have doesn't, no they don't connection fucking care. to, yeah, any class sort. Or the, there, he is. He is the term fail son. Yeah, right. He is a fucking fail son. Yeah. Okay. Six months later, John hosted a family reunion at the Bermuda Naval Air Station. Okay. 11 people from his family uh, came and stayed in luxury rooms. Hey, with... guess who brought uh, Mark's Hard Lemonade? <laughs> Is that that's the family? Yeah, no, it's me, Ross. I'm still here oh. hanging out. Oh, hey. Hey. Yeah. I think no. I accidentally got sent an invitation. Yeah, yeah, please go. All right, take care, everybody. I'm going to swim home. Uh, so 11 people stayed in luxury rooms for seven days at taxpayer expense. Wow. A petty officer, quote, sailors had been assigned to be Cindy's driver. And they carried her bags after she went shopping at the expensive shops on the island. It's like they were her servants. This was the treatment many... Being a little petty. (laughs) This was the treatment many VIPs were getting. But the petty uh, petty officer was a whistleblower, and he, he alerted the media to what was happening. Okay. The base had no military purpose. It was a taxpayer subsidized vacation spot for VIPs. Over, for over two years, 180 VAPs had visited for, quote, official business, but there was no business. Wow. John's group was the largest group to ever go to the base. Well, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Biggest one ever. This is a pretty clearly uh, illegal as government officials and officers can't use planes and cars for vacations. Weird. But the only guy, only the guy who blew the whistle was punished. Oh, 
my God. He was sent to see a psychiatrist, which is pretty common back then in, in, in the military. If you fuck up, they send you to a psychiatrist, psychiatrist who says you're crazy, and then they lock you up. Like, that's the fucking deal. So that's, so that's what they're trying to do to this guy who... Just told the truth. Um, so the psychiatrist told him, quote, I've been contacted before, but never in advance by a fleet commander's staff, a senator's staff, and the secretary of the Navy's staff to try and influence my evaluation. Wow. So John McCain... Was really... Was trying to destroy this guy. John never responded to the allegation that he had tried to get a whistleblower certified as crazy. The base was closed. Party base? Yeah, party base is closed. Party base is gone? Yeah, sorry, bro. But No, that's it, bro. I was just about to fight a war on this keg. Yeah, well, you got to fight a war on a keg in maybe your own house or a, a, a party up in the it's hills. It's not a neutral or battlefield. It's not a neutral battlefield. I kill a lot of kegs in my place alone. I know. Well, that's maybe that's what you should keep doing. This was, it was maybe one never, more party party base? So no, this, party base is gone. Maybe just one bigger beer party base? No, party base is closed. Let me shotgun one beer real quick, party base. Why don't you open a new party base? Why don't you call your house party base? It's just not the same. Mind if I have a moment alone with party base? No, there's no, no, you can't be alone with Can party I just base. drink one beer in party base? No. Let's have a party in party base. Wait, no, okay, now we're going back. Ah, man, fuck this. You're a terrible soldier. John, after all this, decided to sell himself as the guy who was going to clean up Washington, D.C. What's wrong? I just, I'm not a fan of yours either. <laughs> well, no, I think a guy who should clearly be in prison should be the guy to clean up D.C. Yeah. For the first time, he should be in prison for the Keating uh, shit. Yeah. He should be in prison for a long fucking time. A long fucking time. But right now, he's a senator. For the first time, he started supporting financial reform. He took on the meaningless cause of eliminating congressional parking privileges <laughs> oh my God. near the runway at Reagan National Airport. Oh, my God. He spoke about how so they park near the runway and he's trying to get that. But that's one of the one of the few things I go. They should park near the runway because they're congressional people and they have to fucking travel back and forth the constituents. It's also just like, I mean, on the tier of uh, objectives. It's ridiculous. Parking. Well, you know, it gives him, it gives, it gives everybody the impression that he is fighting for something. Right. And he's actually fighting for absolutely fucking nothing. Right. Um, in his speech, he said, he spoke about how Congress was noble and they should demonstrate how honored they were. Quote, to be of the people, no matter how small or symbolic. Jeez. Oh, and this was the first time John McCain was called the Maverick. Uh, I miss McNasty. <laughs> In his story by the Washington Post about how he was a moderate, sometimes fighting his own party to do what was right. Okay. In 1991, the Persian uh, Gulf War broke out, and John was suddenly, for some reason, the go to war guy for everybody. Right. He was suddenly a national authority on foreign affairs. War was here, and it was like the Keating scandal had never happened. Campaigning again in 1992, John was with Cindy. A reporter said, quote, at one point, Cindy playfully twirled McCain's hair and said, you're getting a little thin up there. John's face reddened, and he responded, quote, at least I don't plaster on the makeup like a trollop, you cunt. Oh, my God. John then denied. In front of a reporter? And a couple of aides, yeah. A couple of reporters. <sighs> John denied he said it at first, but then later said, well, it had been a long day and he was tired. She said I was going bald, that cunt. I, if I ever called my wife that we would get a divorce. Sure. I mean, I never would, but, but the, the, I, I can't imagine being in a marriage where you do that. You're not married to the person. No. You're a fucking piece of shit. No, that's like. Poking someone's chest and then they stab you in the throat. Yeah, it's completely insane. Yeah. The retaliation is strong. A bit. John denied he said it at first, right? And then he was elected. Okay, so he was reelected that year. Okay. Cindy had two back surgeries in 89 and became addicted to Percocet and Vicodin, which was super common back then. Um, back surgeries led to addictions. I, uh, I can't. I, I'm still in a little bit of shock as to what he said to his wife. Yeah, yeah, you should be because it's monstrous. Um, Cindy had a charity that did medical work in poor countries and she used the charity's doctors to get scripts. Jeez. Oh, when one of her employees are you got sure wide, these are going to Ethiopia, Cindy? <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> yes. We need to send them all the Percocet right now. And the Vicodin. The, yeah, the yeah, blue, yeah. strong ones. All, all. The strong blue yeah, ones. Oh, the strong ones. The, one, the 180s, not the, not the 40s. Yeah, take them. <laughs> Uh, higher the number, really. Okay, and you know the way I'm taking them. Don't need the bottles. My That's body's right. a bottle. I'm put putting them, them in my body. Put them in the them pinata, over there. and I will come pick yum, them up. Yum, yum. When one of her employees started to get wise, she fired him. He sued and reported her to the DEA. Yeah. A D investigation is not public record. Okay. No one knew about this. <sighs> But then the McCains asked their lawyer to ask the Maricopa County attorney to investigate the employee for extortion. Oh, wow. He did. And doing that, he asked the DEA to turn over what they knew. Now, a local prosecution is public record. Okay. So they basically... That's a misstep. A huge misstep. Once again... (laughs) John got in front of the story and spun it, and it worked. Oh, my God. The papers wrote about Cindy's strength. Cindy was not prosecuted. This trollopy cunt (laughs) is one of the strongest you're ever going to see. Give me your hand, babe. Don't touch my hand. She was not prosecuted and said she was sent to a diversion program. If she'd been a poor minority and not a senator's wife, she would have been locked up. Sure. Well, that's 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 how it works. America, yeah. By now, John's temper was legendary in Arizona. After a run-in over an Arizona water project, an editor at the Arizona Republic said, quote, most of us in the media in Arizona thought of him as a guy who had a terrible temper, occasionally had a foul mouth, a guy who whined and pouted unless he got his way. (laughs) McCain has a temper that is bombastic, volatile, and purple-faced. Sometimes he gets out of control. He's still holding that breath. Yeah, it's like like the two-year-old. He's still the Mm two-year-old. When I go purple, I win! Because people say his um, anger stuff is from uh, what happened to him in Vietnam, but that's not what the uh, history record tells us. In the Senate, John was uh, part of a committee investigating leads on POWs. So there's all these people that still think POWs were still there, especially in the 90s. It was a big thing. Right, right, right. A lot of that is people taking advantage of family members, but there are a lot of family members that want to believe they're... Sure. Their, their son is still alive. Their For brother's sure. still alive. It would make John furious. John didn't think there were any POWs left behind and was hostile to anyone who did. Some were just parents desperate to believe their kid could be alive. During one hearing, John yelled at the sister of an MIA soldier until she started crying. Ugh. Later, an elderly mother of an MIA soldier came to talk to John about her son. And they met in the hallway of the Senate. John was livid. He raised his hand as if he was going to hit her. But then he stopped himself. There's reporters watching this. She was in a wheelchair. Oh, Jesus. So he just grabbed the wheelchair and pushed her away. Oh, my God. The maverick. (sighs) That year, he was reelected to the Senate. But he was still funny. In 1998, when Chelsea Clinton was 18... Does he John, still have some more of those gorilla jokes? Because those are killer. <laughs> John told the joke at a fundraiser, quote, why is Ch- Chelsea Clinton so ugly? Because her father is Janet Reno. Oh, my God, dude. Are you still liking the Maverick, your old uh, Maverick guy? Well, I don't think he's a good roaster. <laughs> <laughs> That's a fair swipe to take at the man. In January 2000, it was revealed... Paxson Communications executives donated 20000 to the Straight Talk Express. Okay. That's John's... Uh, bus. Bus, yeah. The company happened to be waiting for approval for a television license from the FCC. John flew on a Paxson jet to a fundraiser and then sent a letter that was written by a Paxson lobbyist to the FCC the very next day. Then he sent a second letter and then he called... The FCC chair called John's interference, quote, highly unusual. He's, quote, sweating us. John also prodded the FCC for Ameritech. When that story broke, that he, he had got been out doing in that, front of it. he sent out 500 letters to different regulators in order to kill the story by, bio, by burying it in a pile of messy, fact-filled documents. Okay. And it worked. So why not run for president? <laughs> John announced and he ran a somewhat populist campaign, stretching, uh, stressing campaign finance reform, S- uh, slagging off lob- lobbyists, 
closing of corporate tax loopholes and attacking Jerry Falwell and Pat Robertson as, quote, agents of intolerance. He was the pro-warist of the pro-war. John made William Crystal one of his close advisors. Crystal is renowned for being wrong about everything. John hired it's a- It's the Bill Crystal ball. <laughs> it's a Bill Crystal ball. John hired the right wing, uh, a hard right lobbyist as his top foreign policy uh, guy. And he started championing what he called rogue state rollback. Okay. He wanted war. Iraq was first up. This is 2000, yeah. 1999. Yeah, yeah. The media couldn't get enough of John during the 2000 campaign. Tucker Carlson, quote, there are the employees of major news organi- organizations who, usually at night in the bar- hotel bar, slip into the habit of referring to the McCain campaign, ugh, the McCain campaign as we, as in, I hope we kill Bush. Oh, Jesus. McCain hosted barbecues for journalists at his Arizona ranch. TV anchors and newspaper reporters would drink beer and cocktails under the desert sun as John manned the grill. All buddies. He had a bus called the Straight Talk Express. It was packed with journalists and basically a constant news conference with their buddy John. In South Carolina, he was asked about a derogatory term he still used for Vietnamese people. Oh, God, I remember this. Quote, I hate the gooks. Oh, my God. I will hate them as long as I live. Okay, I'm, I'm off the Straight Talk Express. <laughs> Jumping ship. Later, he explained that he was referring just to the prison guards who tortured him. Quote, I will continue to refer to them in a language that might offend some people because of the beating and torture of my friends. It's, it is so weird because while my overall opinion of him was positive, those, these are all Trump roots. Like the, it's like Diet Trump. Like just like the, the way that you are able to manipulate the system and not apologize when you're wrong and just hang in there. Well, thankfully, John did not fight a war in Nigeria. The racist talk express. What? Thankfully, he did not fight a war in Nigeria, right? Yeah. Because gooks would be a different term, wouldn't it? Yes. <gasps> the word gook is in no way a term just applied to Vietnamese. It was first used in 1899 by U.S. soldiers fighting Filipinos. It was used during the Korean War for both Koreans and Chinese. In 2000, it was being used as a slur against Asian or Pacific Islanders. John did not care. Isn't it amazing that even our racist terms are racist themselves? Yeah. Like we like, we're not even adept enough to... Come up with a specific one? Yeah, like we're just like lazy enough to just be like, it's everybody, (laughs) everybody's one. But so he's offending... Yeah. All Asians. Yeah, yes, for All sure. All Asians. For sure. And doesn't care. And doesn't apologize for it. This was all made weirder because he had spent the 80s and 90s pushing for restoring diplomatic relationships with Vietnam and had been part of the meetings to do so. I assume he didn't call the diplomats gooks. No. I would hope not. In February 2000, John dropped out of the Republican race. George W. Bush had won and he had played dirty. He pushed the idea that Bridget was John McCain's, quote, black love child. Who? Bush. Bush, that Bridget? The Bush campaign. Oh. Secretly. Said, robo calls, things like that. Right, right, Put right. out the word that right. Bridget was John McCain's black love child. Okay. Next, John said he would take the, so he's done. That was the end of his election. He lost that state, and then he was out. Also, just a great detail to America's open-mindedness. Yeah, yeah, and and that's Carl Rove who was behind that. And if you want, you can see Masterclass with, with David, uh, Axelrod David Axelrod and Carl, yeah, Carl yeah. Rove having a good talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Next, John said he would take the government back from big Do money. Do I need to be here? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, because I'm going to crush you at the end of this. No, I'm crushed. It gets so much worse. Oh. Next, John said he would take the government back from big money special interests. A nonpartisan, nonprofit organization called the Reform Institute was created. Uh-huh. Well, things that are always named stuff like that are always on the up and up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, John was the honorary chair. The No Take Money Group. The seed money came from a formal Merrill Lynch CEO. Oh, which is the best way to get reform. Yeah, no, for sure. As a nonprofit, the Reform Institute could take unlimited, unregulated donations that John's PAC could not take. 
Strangely, uh, strangely, all the Institute's political positions, nonpartisan, aligned exactly with John McCain's. The Institute paid John for public appearances. His campaign manager was president and made uh, 400000 in three years. The Reform Institute used the same office space as McCain's PAC, his re-election committee, and a lobbying firm that he used named Davis Manafort. Mm, there's, there's a name <laughs> familiar with. Between 1997 and uh, June 2006, John collected $2.6 million uh. from telecommunications, media, and tech uh, firms. Wow. In return, he wrote letters to the FCC for those companies. Twice, the Reform Institute solicited 100000 from Cablevision after the CEO testified in front of John's Senate Commerce Committee. Wait, what does that mean exactly? That it means that he, after the fucking guy went and testified, John would grill him, and then he'd be like, hey, man, we can actually make this work. John left the Reform Institute in 2005, but its goals stayed aligned with his. About the Reform Institute, the chair of the Federal Election Commission said, quote, appearance of corruption, anyone? <laughs> wow. So he kind of like, he went sort of real sassy on it. <laughs> uh, conflict of interest, party of McCain. Uh, hello? <laughs> And yet John's image remained the opposite. He was the maverick. Mm -hmm. He was a moderate. Mm -hmm. And he cared about finance reform. Mm -hmm. In 2001, he said, quote, as long as the wealthiest Americans and the richest organiz organized interests can make the six and seven figure donations to political parties and gain the special access to power that such generosity confers on the donor, mo most Americans will dismiss the most virtuous politician's claim of patriotism. But that that's what he's doing is what he's it's doing. what he's doing. Right. John sponsored the bipartisan campaign reform act. And that's spelled B-U-Y. <laughs> bipartisan. Also known as the McCain Feingold Act. It was to curb soft money. <clears throat> Which is what that fucking institute is. Let him police it, would you? 9-11 mm. came. Finally, a feel good moment. John then took the lead in pushing for war with everyone. Quote, there's other organizations besides Mr. Bin Laden who are bent on destruction of the United States. It isn't just Afghanistan we're talking about. Syria, Iraq, Iran, perhaps North Korea, Libya, and others. He wants to go to war with everyone. I mean, and others leaves it pretty open. France, Ireland. He told Jay Leno some other countries, possibly Iraq, Iran, and Syria, had aided Bin Laden. After the anthrax attacks in America, he told David Letterman that, quote, we'll do fine in Afghanistan. Well, why is he just doing the late night run, sir? Like, well, just... everybody loves him. <laughs> OK, but he's, he's the liberals. <laughs> Still, it's like a weird like. But everybody. Lo so that's the thing about McCain. He's not like other senators. He's always on those shows. Yeah. He's constantly doing this. Uh, we'll do fine in Afghanistan. The second phase is Iraq. Some of this anthrax may, and I emphasize may, have come from Iraq. It uh -huh. didn't. No. On Larry King, he talked about Saddam's weapons of mass destruction. Quote, the Czech government has revealed meetings, contacts between Iraqi intelligence and Mohammed Atta. The evidence is very clear. We, so we will have to act. On Nightline, quote, there is no doubt as to Saddam's avid pursuit of weapons of mass destruction and the means to deliver them. Exciting and completely not true. In January 2002, John went to the Middle East. On the USS uh, Theodore Roosevelt, uh, he stood on the flight bridge and he watched fighter planes taking off on their bombing runs to Afghanistan. And he yelled, quote, next up, Baghdad. Oh, God. For the next 15 months, John's hard on for an Iraq invasion could be seen from space. <laughs> that's uh, that's exaggeration. Oh, OK. That's not a fact. Well, we think we see it, but. <laughs> Is he near a forest? <laughs> His top foreign policy advisor set up a group called the Committee for the Liberation of Iraq. John was the honorary co-chair. In September 2002, John said the war could, quote, be won fairly easily with an overwhelming victory in a very short time period. Sure. He said Iraqis... By the way, that is true, because we're almost done there. We are almost done. He said the Iraqis would treat us as liberators. Mm -hmm. On October 10, 2002, the Senate rushed to give President Bush the power to use force against Iraq. John said Saddam, quote, is on a crash course to construct a nuclear weapon. Well, I mean, if anyone knows about a crash course. <laughs> and has developed stocks of germs and toxins 
in sufficient quantities to kill the entire population of the Earth multiple times. He develops nuclear weapons with which he would hold his neighbors and us hostage. Just to be safe, we will kill the world twice. And then he said Al-Qaeda and Saddam worked together. All of this, of course, was a complete fucking lie. Sounded real real at the yeah, time, though, did. man. It did. Pretty convincing. We did invade Iraq, and he was right about everything, obviously. Yeah, we were welcomed as liberators. Yeah, we that found happened. the uh, germ quick, shed. In and out of the germ shed. We found all the nuke. Yeah. The big nuke uh, bunker. Yeah. Uh, John, still, after all this, somehow seen as a maverick. Such a maverick. Then in 2004, when John Kerry was running for president, he asked John McCain to be his vice president candidate. And we all know how that went. Because John was every liberal's favorite Republican, despite, you know, everything about him. He was now often on The Daily Show swapping jokes with John Stewart. I assume they never joked about John uh, spending his career being anti-abortion. Anyway, John was elected to his fourth term in the Senate. You're really taking some swipes over here, Anthony. In 2005, Oleg Deripaska, a criminal and the ninth wealthiest person in the world, also known as Putin's oligarch, oh God, bought Mo a Montenegro aluminum plant and privatized it. The plant accounted for 40% of Montenegro's GDP. He basically took control of Montenegro's economy by buying this plant. Jesus. Montenegro then sought independence from Serbia. A multi-million dollar campaign was run by lobbying firm Davis Manafort. Davis was John McCain's campaign manager. He set up an intimate meeting. So there's meeting. like 10 people in the world, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's where we're at. He set up a meeting with John and Deripaska at a villa in Switzerland. Of course. You've got to do it classy. People found out about it, and John sent out a campaign letter that so a campaign letter that said, quote, any contact between Mr. Deripaska and the senator was social and incidental. That lie still holds up. Yeah. And now, Terry Bosca had been banned from entering the United States uh, due to death threats, extortion, racketeering, and money laundering. Anything bad? No. Uh, a couple years before, he had hired one of John's aides and Bob Dole to lobby the State Department to overturn the ban. Dole then got John to promote Montenegro's independence. Sure. And I'm sure Davis didn't hurt either. He called it, quote, the greatest European democracy project since the end of the Cold War. I, I, this is unbelievable. <laughs> this is, I mean, <sighs> that level. Uh, the referendum passed. A few months later, John celebrated his 70, 70th birthday on a yacht hosted by convicted Italian fellow Raffaello Foglieri and his girlfriend Anne Hathaway in Montenegro. Okay. Well, that's the guy who just ghosted Anne Hathaway. Yeah. Uh, as the Iraq war dragged on, and it was a complete disaster, John began pushing for an increase in troops. He wanted 20,000 more in Baghdad and 100,000 over five years. Opposition ads in the U.S. called it, quote, McCain's idea. Presidential candidate John Edwards called it the McCain doctrine. As John he, Edwards, good guy. Yeah, yeah, good guy. Good he, guy. He's also a great uh, family man. Good guy. Um, uh, John ran for president again. In 2006, during the campaign, John explained how he felt in the run-up to the Iraq War. It's during a debate. Okay. Quote, the American people were led to believe this could be some kind <laughs> of day at the beach, which many of us fully understood from the beginning would be a very, very difficult undertaking. Some politicians went on Letterman and Leno, and they kept perpetuating stuff like this. Well, you know, the truth is that, yes, bullshit, it also is a testament to how dumb we are and how weak our attention spans are that we're but unable to our, retain our, reality. Our job, this is the media's job. Our job is to react to truth, which we're not given. Yeah, if the media does not immediately say that's fucking bullshit, no. it's really hard to remember because that how many be the politicians- That should the name of a news network. How, how many politicians are doing that, what he does? So, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it's their job to fucking- I mean, is it not every politician? It's Jake Tapper to immediately say this. Hey, hey. But they're buddies. You so stay away from Taps. He's a straight shooter, man. Oh, I took out the thing about him. Fair and balanced. Um, McCain said he told Bush to dump- Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld, quote, I'm the only one that said Rom Rumsfeld had to go. Yeah. The actual quote from 2004, Rumsfeld is doing a fine job. Well, yeah, but I think if little bit you different. read into that, they're a little bit fire him. Different. Yeah, uh, I don't you're know. right. Yeah. You're right. 
Because fine job is like, he's doing okay. But you can also hear it. Let me say, let, yep. here you go. Yep. Oh, Rumsfeld? Oh, yeah. He's doing a fine job. Okay. Yeah, no, you, you say it like that. Hashtag eye roll. Okay. Now I totally, now I'm on board. Ugh. That's how I said it. <sighs> the Straight Talk Express was back. But this time, the Straight Talk Express was much harder. John, it's a shame that the VP was riding in the bullshit what's going on express <laughs> behind him. <laughs> I'm in the lie car. <laughs> I'll be in the crazy mobile with the clowns. John had to walk the fine line between being a maverick and courting the religious right now. Yeah. During one interview, he was asked about gay marriage and said, quote, I think gay marriage should be allowed if there is a ceremony kind of thing, if you want to call it that. Then a campaign strategist whispered something to John. Soon, during a totally unrelated question, John burst out with, quote, Can I just mention one other thing? On the issue of gay marriage, I believe that people want to have private ceremonies. That's fine. I do not believe gay marriage should be legal. Wow. So he just doesn't know what to say anymore because he's trying to court the well, right. Well, that guy was the, on the Straight Talk Express, so he just came <laughs> off. Now, this is Straight Talk, not Gay Talk. People called him out for taking new positions on many topics. John denied it. Quote, What specific area have I, quote, changed? Nobody can name it. Okay, I will. The Bush tax cuts, the estate tax, waterboarding, hunting terrorists in Pakistan, kicking Russia out of the G8, uh, troop surge in Afghanistan, the GI Bill, storing nuclear waste at Yucca Mountain, teaching intelligent design, funding no child left behind, offshore drilling, his own immigration policy, and withdrawal uh, timelines for Iraq. Give other me a 21st. That, other than that, he didn't switch on anything. Exactly. In 2000, John had denounced Jerry Falwell as a, quote, agent of intolerance. Yeah. Now he was giving oh, no. the commencement speech at, at Falwell's Liberty breakfast. University. Oh, God. He sought the support of Texas preacher John Hagee, even though Hagee had blamed Hurricane Katrina on New Orleans' acceptance of gay people. Well, I mean, to be fair, we've not proved the contrary. We haven't. Nobody's sat down Katrina for an interview since. Uh, also, Ohio preacher Rod Parsley, whom John, call, John called a spiritual guide. Parsley believes America was founded in part to destroy Islam. But after negative headlines attacking his image as a moderate, John repudiated the Hagee and Parsley's endorsements. Okay. At a town hall, someone asked John about his policy on Tehran. John said, quote, that old, uh, that old Beach Boys, uh, uh, oh. bomb, 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 bomb. Anyway, <laughs> uh, when he was criti criticized about being so callous about bombing another country, he said, quote, lighten up and get a life. Oh my when God. he was asked if that was insensitive, he said, quote, insensitive to what, Iranians? Like, uh, uh, yes. <laughs> From the affirmative times, yes, sir. <laughs> Not a Republican thought John should be president. He once almost came to blows on the Senate floor with an elderly Strom Thurmond. Okay, uh, let me just say I'm yeah. for that. Yeah, yeah. I <laughs> mean, pro, I, yeah, for sure. Super pro <laughs> someone punching Strom Thurmond in the face. Well, but if you punch Strom Thurmond in the face, it's just like punching some paper mache with dust in the middle. <laughs> it's just like, poof, your fist goes right through it, and you're like, ugh, cobwebs. God, look at all this white. Hey, my spiders are leaking. Strom! White spiders! Hey! Um... He also got, uh, John also got into a fist fight with R Congressman Rick Renzi at one point. Jesus. Former Republican. I imagine being an adult and getting into a fist fight in Congress. <laughs> I know. Uh, I probably would do we'll that. We'll get there. Yeah, yeah. yeah you, 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 for I, sure. I advocate it. Yeah. Um, former Republican Senator Robert Smith publicly said John's temper, quote, would place this country in, at risk in international affairs and the world perhaps in danger. Could you... Just imagine. Right. <laughs> Republican Senator Thad Cochran agreed. Quote, the thought of his being president sends a cold chill down my spine. He is erratic. He is hot headed. He loses his temper and he worries me. Maverick. But the press loved him. Yep. He was a maverick. John was asked during the campaign how many houses he owned and he could not remember. He oh, said he'd have a, to ask his staff. That's a, wow. What, this, these are not good answers. <laughs> Uh, let me ask my uh, let me ask the maids in the quarters. Where's my boy? I have a small Asian boy that tells me things. I uh, how many houses is it? Sixteen. There it is. Cindy and John owned at least eight. Wow. One they bought for their twenty-two-year-old daughter Megan. Years later, Megan would have a shit fit about socialism on the View. <laughs> the McCain's owned thirteen cars. Their budget for household employees was two hundred and seventy three thousand dollars a year. Oh my God. In August, John picks Sarah Palin to be his VP running mate. 
<clears throat> she had been governor of Alaska for two years after being a mayor of a small town. John met her once and spoke to her once on the phone before picking her. There appeared to be no vetting by his campaign. I think that that's safe to say. Palin had tried to get her former brother-in-law, a state trooper, fired. As governor, she spent over 13000 in taxpayer funds to attend 10 religious events and meetings with Christian pastors. She even billed the state for visits to her own church. <laughs> well... <laughs> I mean, we know what we're dealing with. She's an American treasure. Yeah. I mean, just for sure. something special. Palin was a joke to the media, routinely mocked, and came across as rather stupid in interviews. She couldn't name books she had read. She well, that's a gotcha question. Yeah. She couldn't name Supreme Court justices. Well, that's a gotcha question. She would say absurd things, but her anti-intellectualism and disrespect for facts began to be cheered by the GOP base. John still seemed the decent maverick liberals thought he was at the beginning of the campaign when it was close. He had ruled out going after Obama for his relationship with Reverend Jeremiah Wright, who, uh, if you want to go read his quotes, read the go to the Jeremiah Wright controversy and you can read the quotes for why he was considered to be crazy. And they're all remarkably spot on. He said stuff like, well, 9-11 happened because the chickens came home to roost, right. which is why 9-11 happened. Yeah, but we're not allowed to talk about the right. truth. Right, you can't say the truth. Yeah. When a conservative radio host at a rally called Obama Hussein three times, John held a press conference to apologize. Quote, it will never happen again. But then the financial crisis hit. John suspended his campaign and went back to D.C. saying he was going back to help fix the problem. But when he got there, he had no plan and he had no idea what to do. And Republicans were making things difficult and John ended up looking like an idiot. He plummeted in the polls. And then his campaign went dirty. Senator Lindsey Graham said, quote, the campaign would go down in history as stupid if they don't unleash Sarah Palin. And Sarah Palin was unleashed. She went after Obama as un-American and very suspect. John hired the two guys in 2000 who had run the campaign against him, claiming Bridget was his, quote, black love child. Hmm. Now they ran ads claiming Obama supported teaching sex ed to kindergartens, and in the ads, they darkened his skin. Oh, my God. In a lot of McCain's ads, Obama's skin was darkened. The campaign became a smorgasbord of racist dog whistles. Obama was all but flat out called a Muslim terrorist or an agent sent to overthrow the U.S. government. The trick was simple. Make Obama appear on American, which was easy to do because of his name and his skin color. Palin, quote, this is not a man who sees America as you see America and I see America. Our uh. opponent is someone who sees America, it seems, as being so imperfect that he's palling around with terrorists uh. who would target their own country. Uh. It's so McCain, fucking racist. McCain's campaign put out an ad saying Obama was associated with a domestic terrorist, Bill Ayers of the Weather Underground from the 60s. McCain, quote, the Amer American people know a radical when they hear it. And John McCain is not the candidate in this election they should be concerned about. He said the American. It's the black guy. <laughs> he said, I don't know why you're doing that in Ross Perot's voice. You hey, I'm John, back. You should do it in John McCain's voice. I don't have a John McCain. I got a Ross Perot, though. <laughs> John McCain sent me. He said the American people had to know the full extent of Obama's relationship with Ayers. The McCain campaign contacted a man whose home had been blown up back in the day and the weather ground was suspected. Yeah, it was that guy. He blew up my house. The man put out a statement, quote, Barack Obama's friend tried to kill my family. Oh, my God, dude. Well, I mean, can we? Uh, the Maverick. Uh, the liberal's friend, John McCain. The campaign sent out flyers with mugshots of Ayers and the words terrorist, radical, friend of Obama. <laughs> Rallies now had speakers saying Obama's middle name or as John said, quote, it will never happen again. From an ad, quote, think about how you feel on November 5th if you see the news that Barack Hussein Obama is president of the United States. Ads asked, quote, who is Barack Obama? And reminded the audiences of his terrorist connections. One ad, quote, how dangerous. 
Sure, these ideas have been around for a while in the crazy corners of the right wing Internet. But now a GOP presidential candidate was saying them and giving them credence. John McCain was legitimizing the right wing fringe madness. Just kind of lifting the lid on Pandora's box a gentle bit. Now when John took the stage, people yelled out, treason, traitor, terrorist, off with his head. One woman yelled out, quote, he's a bomb. At he's a, a bomb? Obama. Yeah, he's going to go in and blow up the country. He's, he's going to take over the White House and destroy the country. Yeah. At a rally, Palin blamed Katie Couric for making her look stupid, and the crowd turned on the press, screaming at reporters okay. and a camera crew. The sound man was black. A man yelled, quote, a racial epithet at him and said, quote, sit down, boy. They wore a Saracuda T-shirts. Palin said Obama was part of a, quote, group that launched a campaign of bombings that would target the Pentagon and our U.S. Capitol. I mean, this. A man in the audience yelled, quote, kill him. Oh, my God. She did not respond and went on, quote, Obama doesn't like American soldiers. Oh, my God. Still Obama won. It was not close. Yes, but we'll put a pin in this rhetoric. Well, the damage was done, wasn't it? The path was laid. This was the first time people saw the right riled up and what will become normal under Trump. John's campaign was literally the path for Trump. John remained a senator and went back to his normal maverick ways. On a night in August 2009, he tweeted, quote, Late evening with Colonel Gaddafi at his ranch in Libya. Interesting meeting with an interesting man. He left out that he'd offered to sell weapons to Gaddafi and ensured him the U.S. wanted to provide Libya with le- weapons for his security. John was reelected in November, his fifth, full, his fifth term in the Senate. Less than two years later, as the Arab Spring moved to Libya in 2011, John enthusiastically supported removing a guy named Gaddafi from power. Hmm, right. Isn't that his buddy? He made numerous visits to rebel uh, strongholds, uh, and then this led to a NATO-backed no-fly zone and a bombing campaign. Eventually, his rebel friends sodomized Gaddafi to death in the streets. <sighs> Libya would it's become a one of those images that just sticks with you. It's not great. Libya would become a bastion of extremism with open slave markets that op- operate today. John spent years pushing for the CIA to send weapons to different groups in Syria. While visiting the country, he posed for a photograph with a group of men he should he said should be given weapons. Two of the men in the photograph were later ID'd as men who had kidnapped 11 Lebanese Shiite pilgrims. John's spokesman, spokesman said that was, quote, unfortunate. All right, we're going to file this one under oopsie. <laughs> okay. In 2013, I'm going to fucking butcher this name. Iran's former president, uh, uh, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. 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 Aaron for three said he wanted to become the first Iranian to go to space. John tweeted, quote, So Ahmadinejad wants to be the first Iranian in space. Wasn't he just there last week? And then he linked to a story about Iran launching a monkey into space. Oh, my God. Well, he's a maverick. Stop saying that. <laughs> An hour later, John... Uh, that is... F- oh, my what? God. What? What is it? Well, it's racist. Oh, so the guy who voted five times against MLK Day might be racist? Maybe. An hour later, John uh, tweeted, quote, regarding Iran space tweet, lighten up, folks. Can't everyone take a joke? In November 2014, he was reelected to a sixth that, term. That's a problem with a lot of those, like, I don't even want to say, like, right wing, but, like, fringe lunatics is that the jokes, they're not funny. Right. Like, there's no humor to the jokes. No. There's just, like, there's that you're just, it's just offensive. Yeah, it's just offensive and punching down. That's all it is. Okay. Just wanted to get that yeah, out it's there. It's great. If you're saying it's great. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So he's elected to a sixth term. In his entire career, he never won an election without massively outspending his opponents. In the run-up to the 2016 election, John said in an interview that the Republican Senate would never vote to seat a Hillary Clinton Supreme Court justice if she won. Hmm. Hmm. It's interesting. Yes, because of Merrick Garland. Well, right. But everyone loves him. Right. In 2015, while Secretary of Defense John Kerry was in the Ukraine trying to broker a peace deal, John was in Congress pushing a bill to arm the Ukrainian government against Obama's policy. <laughs> so undermining the policy of the president because he wanted to. And because he's black. 
In July, yes, in July 2017, John learned he had an aggressive brain tumor. The Republican Senate was voting to kill Obama's health care plan. John flew out. Uh, 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 shit. Oh, John flew out to cast the deciding vote to allow debate to pr proceed. So if he'd gone out and voted for debate not to proceed, it would have ended everything right there. But what he did was he flew out and voted for debate to proceed on Obamacare, whether or not to kill it. But that did that vote not come that vote did not come down to McCain's vote as to whether or not what was that it was vote? To get, I believe it was to get out of committee or something. But I remember his vote. He 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 was deciding vote on whether or not they should keep debating about Obamacare. So he could have flown out and voted to stop the debate on Ob 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 Obamacare being reversed. And that would have been the end of it. Right. But he didn't do that. He voted to continue the debate. Half Maverick. Which means that for a few days, everyone in America is terrified and being basically held under just complete fear that they will lose their health care. He also gave a speech about how bad the parties were and criticized Democrats for pa passing Obamacare in the first place. On July uh, 28th, the Republicans put a repeal bill to stop parts of Obamacare together. John rolled into the Senate, oh, right. okay. walked up. This is what I was thinking of. Gave a big thumbs down, killing the bill. Liberals went crazy for this move. The Maverick had done it again. Liberals did not seem to notice Senators Murkowski and Collins had also voted no, repeatedly. Yeah. The media was all over John the Maverick again. Vox and other liberal media companies lost their minds at the greatness of John. In 2015, he had voted for a bill to gut Obamacare's Medicaid expansion. Oh, and he had uh, just voted for the Republicans' previous attempt to repeal the bill. But now he's a hero because he voted out of spite against Trump. But the media let John get away with everything. In September 2017, he was interviewed by uh, Jake, Jack, is it Jake or Jack Tapper? Jake, Jake Tapper. Yeah, yeah, Jake Tapper about North Korea. John said, quote, if Kim Ung Yoon acts in aggressive, in an aggressive fashion, the price will be extinction. One would think a senator casually making a remark about genocide would lead to a follow-up question by Tapper, no, he just moved on to DACA. So was the life of John McCain. John died from brain cancer on August 25th, 2018. After, after he died, liberals sent around a video on social media of a time that showed what a great man John McCain was. He was in Minnesota during the campaign against Obama, and a woman called Obama, quote, an Arab, and John corrected her. No, ma'am, he's a decent family man, citizen, that I just happen to have disagreement with disagreements with on fundamental issues. And that's what this campaign is all about. So first point, he just, he didn't uh, defend Arabs at all. He acted like they're all bad. Second point, this was a moment of his own making. This was the height of he and Palin calling Obama terrorist and putting out ads saying he was un-American and putting out ads in which he was making him seem darker skinned and calling him a fucking terrorist. He had one moment of near decency in the middle of a heinous campaign. And this is what people decided to pass around. The next day on a phone call with reporters, one of McCain's national security advisors rattled off a list of villains who supported Obama, including Iran's Ahmadinejad and Hamas. And the Riddler. John McCain was literally laying the path for Trump. At the end of his campaign, he began insinuating that the election result was rigged for Obama. <laughs> and, and clearly Trump watched all this. An argument can be made that John McCain may have done more damage to this country than any American in history because Trump followed his path. The Maverick! How do you feel about John McCain now? Want to go get milkshakes? <laughs> Man, what this story is, is the story of the worst media in the fucking world. Jake Tapper, Vox, all these motherfuckers are not doing their job and pieces of shit are being repeatedly elected and put into office and they're fucking monsters and they get to get away with it and do it repeatedly. The, I mean, the, the truth is that there's always going to be 
liars and evil people. Always. The bridge we have is that media tells us what's going on. And who's good and who's bad. And who, yeah, and they, they, they umpire it. And now at this point, they'd rather be in the players' locker room than in the stands. I mean, I remember, I remember the election, and I remember feeling super uncomfortable watching the rallies. But until I started reading again and going the, the through the McCain ones, yeah, yeah. Until I started reading again and going through the transcripts and going and looking at some videos and watching what had actually happened, I I totally had lost the connection that oh that's exactly what Trump did. There is no difference between the campaign that McCain ran uh, in the last month and a half and the McCain. And, and the Trump, Trump yeah. there is no difference, particularly when it comes to Sarah Palin. But yeah. calling him a terrorist, you know, all the, the racist shit. Well, like, and Palin attacking the media for, uh, Palin attacking the for media. saying that asking questions is out of line. And as much as John McCain wants to act like he picked the wrong person, he engaged in all that shit. He approved all that shit. Yeah. He's the one who put out ads saying he was a terrorist. Yeah. McCain's a... McCain's a fucking evil motherfucker. And he set this up. As much as people want to say it's about racism, if John McCain doesn't do that, do those people come out of the woodwork? If they're not if they don't feel that the government that they're that their well, highest their highest elected official is 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 using their speech and pushing their agendas, do they do they come out? Does Trump make that move? Because for every guy that does something, there's a no. path. Someone is always putting a path down. And and the truth is that it's like, yeah, it's it is. It's the foundation because it's like it's like a lot of the stuff in hyper hyper normalization where it's like the way this stuff starts and escalates. Like it didn't start with suicide bombings. It started with someone throwing a bomb in a crowded area. Right. And then all of a sudden, you know. They have someone has an idea to actually just like convince people that you go to heaven if yeah. you put a bomb on yourself. And then that's and then it's just like that evolves further and further and that becomes commonplace. And then you have like suicide like it all. I mean, it just all starts with a wish. <laughs> it all starts with one kooky thinker who's just like you ask why I ask why not. Jesus, God. Okay, so um, I'm going to give this speech. Uh, like three weeks ago, the IPCC put out a report. Um, that is the uh, basically the UN group, about 155 uh, uh, climate scientists, and they are pretty conservative in what they usually put out. And they, and they basically said we have uh, 10 years to change what we're doing. We have 10 years to stop using the amount of carbon we're using and to change the way that we exist on this planet and if we don't change that in 10 years, it's over. At that point, we spiral out of control and our children live in a hell world in 15, 60 years. So, you know, the other day my son, my son asked, we were driving and he said, uh, hey, I wanna, when I get older, I wanna uh, own a house and uh, I wanna get married and I wanna play baseball. And my first thought was, well, you're, and he said he wanted to have kids, two kids. And my first thought was, well, you're not going to have children. Because if what we're doing occurs in 10 years, no one's going to have children. Because look at what's happened in California now. In, and that's from the pollution we, we put in the atmosphere in the 90s. We haven't even gotten to the pollution we put in the atmosphere to date. That comes in 25 and 30 years. So we have to do something. We are controlled by fossil fuel companies and a GOP that doesn't believe in science is out of their fucking minds and a media that doesn't give a shit because they're also controlled by big corporations. So we came up with this group. It's called Planet Change 10, P-L-A-N-I-T, Change 10. Right two now, words, right, plan and it. Yeah, right now there's a Facebook group and a 
Twitter. There's a Reddit, a subreddit. There's a Twitter. Uh, there's going to be more things. We'll put. We'll do a web page. We have to talk to organizers, but we want people to go sign up now. Here's the idea. Everyone's trying to have this uh, discussion uh, on a on an intellectual level, and um, there's no way to combat the bullshit and stupidity and nonsense that comes back uh, to, at scientists. And scientists have done the job. Scientists have proved that climate change is happening. Um, there's no debate anymore. There's no questions to ask. The only people who are debating are the oil companies. And uh, and if you don't believe in that, then you shouldn't believe in air or like the ground or grass. Um, it's just something that is. The, the argument also has changed so much. It changes on their all the side. time. Their argument was there's no it climate. doesn't exist. Oh now it's, it's not hot. man-made, and now it's shifting into hey, it's too late. Sorry. Right. So, so the fight is something we need to undertake as scientists have done their job and now it's time for people to take over and people to communicate and and what's happening out there is that people are scared like when i talk to my when i talk to my kid i'm fucking devastated um and and i feel bad about his future and and there's a lot of parents out there that way and there's a lot of kids i know um that go uh to sleep crying high school kids I, i've gotten three letters after we started talking about this from high school kids who say they're bursting into tears all the time that's the world we're creating. And it's not even there yet. And we're not even as bad as it's going to yeah. get. So, so what we want to do is use, put, bring people together because there's a psychological thing that happens when people learn about how bad this is and they shut down. And it's pretty well documented, so it makes it hard to communicate and it makes it hard for people to do anything and be active. So our idea is to get people into groups in each city you're in, in each different place, and um, it can be, you can be there in person. We can do meetings where people get together. We can just do meetings online. But the idea is to get people talking about how fucking scared they are and, and be honest about this shit and be honest about what's happening to you and how you feel. And in those groups will be artists. We want to bring artists in and we want artists to be inspired to use that fear to create art. And that can be videos, that can be you know just drawings, paintings, whatever. And we just start putting the art out there. And the, and the art's message is, we are fucking scared shitless and you don't care about our children. Because there is no other way to combat it intellectually. Let's hit people in their heart. Uh, so that's what we're doing. It's, it's called uh, Planet Change 10, P-L-A-N-I-T, Change 10. Um, and we'd like people to go sign up. And we'd like to get as many people involved in this and uh, get something going. Yeah. Yeah. You think of that doomsday clock. Part of the problem is that it hasn't struck midnight yet. <laughs> <laughs> like, it allows us, like, there's still time to crunch for the exam. And it's yeah. like, there's not. There's not. I mean, it, you know, a, a, a town in California was just wiped off the map. And, and, and there was this great, there's a really great scientist uh, called Daniel uh, Sloan. He, He's a really, really smart dude. Um, and he put up some tweets that explained why it happened. And it's purely climate change. Yeah. It's 100 percent. It's not it's not the management of the forest. It's not. It's it's 100 percent climate change. And this is what it is. This is what we're going to live with. You, you, Towns burning down. Also, the idea of like the, the idea that like it is culpability falls on one thing. It's stupid. It, it's just like you, the, the time to argue and mince words over like what is causing fires that are wiping out towns. Yeah. You know, it's it's all of them. Yeah. Like, but the one thing that, you know, is always going to be a creator and a starter of this stuff is the thing that we can change, which is man-made climate change, which is what all this this shit is. And I think we can change stuff if we if we hit people in their hearts and yeah. their their stomachs. Well, and the truth is that it's all like that's what I mean with the doomsday clock. The shit is going to hit the fan. We're just like, well, it hasn't hit yet. We'll clean the shit out of the fan once it hits the fan. Yeah, it's no, like it's, no. it's hitting the fan. Yeah, and there's no technical. There's no tech uh, savior coming. That's yeah. bullshit. Every scientist who knows anything is like no that's garbage well it would also be nice to actually just treat the earth well for yeah, what about not the it? sake of just taking care yeah. of the earth we've got fucking solar we got wind let's get it going yeah all right thank you everybody thanks aaron great uh, call on how to pronounce uh mahmoud Ademanjan's name <laughs> we signed cars hybrid ones <laughs>